Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast and get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Susan Baumgerto. She's an internal medicine physician. We're going to talk about her book, The Menopause Menu. Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. We'll get into your book in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey. Yeah, from Seattle, grew up in Ontario, Canada, came back, actually got my degree in architecture and urban planning, went right into med school, residency in internal medicine, stayed here in Seattle, worked 25 years in a company, a position owned, and uh, pivoted in about two years ago, started my own business, my MD advocate, and then of course, published my book. Excellent. And tell me about that transition from clinical medicine into your more entrepreneurial ventures. Yeah, boy, it was really, it was daring as many people kind of peel away from something they've done for so long, but it was time. Uh, Many things were going on, you know, we can talk about burnout and moral injury, but truthfully, you know, I wasn't ready to retire and I thought, you know, I can still give back. And so I found a way to serve patients in a different way. How scary was it to make that transition? A lot of doctors, they like that security of clinical medicine. And I talked to a lot of entrepreneurial physicians when they take that first step is often the scariest, but tell me how that was for you. It is, you know, I think sometimes you reach almost that breaking point and literally I walked away and I walked away from a three digit, very, you know, six figure, incredible income to nothing. And that amazingly allowed me to just kind of become creative and I could just kind of peel back those layers of angst and and frustration and find out what I wanted to do. And so it was very therapeutic. So your book is called The Menopause Menu. Tell us how this book came together. Yeah, so it's an all-in-one gift book. It's a medical guide. It's a recipe book for navigating menopause. And it's very experiential. So there's a lot of color. There's pictures. There's photographs. There's haiku. There's poetry. There's art. There's a lot of medical advice, too. And so, you know, I drew inspiration from all the women I've been caring for for, gosh, 30 years now. And it was really clear that more information was needed about just the entire menopause journey. And this, you know, this information needs to be, yes, evidence-based, but also holistic. And I was really trying to kind of put all that together. And I hearkened back to a program I developed called Menu for Change. And it ran from 2012 to 2019. And it was really, women came into it to, to lose weight, but it really kind of morphed into a wellness program. So it embraced a lot of different things like nutrition, movement, and sleep, and stress, And so, you know, all those kind of health related categories were emphasized. And so it seemed like a natural extension to kind of frame information about menopause and the midlife transition with kind of a menu based theme. So I launched my free website, Menopause Menu first, and then this all led to the foundation for my book. What would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions about menopause today? Yeah, so I would say crazy to start with this one. It's not just about women, right? You know, so all the people, I always say everyone knows someone going through menopause. It could be your mom, your aunt, your partner, your daughter, you know, and so I think it affects everybody when you kind of look at, oh gosh, you can't look at the Washington Post or New York Times or any kind of tabloid. To, you know, there's always a menopause article, right? It could be yeah. menopause in the workplace. And so one of the things I really like to impart is this book, my book is really for everyone. It's not just someone who's, you know, 45 to 54 and and trying to navigate that time. It definitely is for them, but it really extends to so many other people. Now in your Kevin MD excerpt, you talk about various case studies about some of the chronic diseases that's associated with menopause, some of the physiological changes that women go through. So let's talk about that last one. What are some of the physiological changes that women go through during menopause? Yeah. So, you know, the list is so long. I think you can put almost anything you think of it, you know, joking aside, you know, the top ones, of course, everyone's heard about hot flashes and night sweats and sleep disruption and vaginal dryness and libido changes and, you know, all those things. But then you really start to look at, you know, kind of the other layers and there's, there's mental stress, there's angst, there's mental illness that may have been there. And it's kind of, you know, unmasked, you know, there's fatigue, what doesn't cause fatigue? There's, there's so much there, you know, you can think about the skin changes or hair changes or your GI system or your neurologic and brain fog. So it's, to me, it was almost a little daunting. Like, how do you address all that? And so I kind of condense that into 16 chapters and I, each chapter would address one symptom or one, one disease condition. So that made it a little easier for me to navigate at least. So in the exam room, we're both internal medicine, primary care 
physicians, what are some things that I should look out for when I talk to women about menopause? Yeah, well, I think this is almost a, it's so simplistic, but it's so powerful listening. You know, many women as patients, I'm a patient too, boy, the visit's fast paced. I know that goes, your hands on the doorknob, you're running late, there's too much going on. It's like, oh, I'm tired. Like, oh my gosh. You know, so the tendency is just, oh, let's do a bunch of labs. And when a bunch of labs are normal, it's like, well, I don't know, go go exercise. Well, duh, you think they, they probably know about exercise yeah. nutrition. So it's really listening to what's going on, allowing a little space, a little, you know, I mean, it's hard, but allowing time for that dialogue, um, making sure women don't feel like they're crazy or they're being histrionic or, or, you know, there, there are some pretty, you know, interesting things that happen before you're in menopause. So let's say you're only 42. Like, why am I having hot flashes? Well, maybe as a physician, it's important to make sure they don't have a lymphoma or a pheochromocytoma or some other, you know, zebra diagnosis. But you know, maybe it's pre peri kind of early menopausal symptoms. So allowing the space for them to talk about it, I think is key. So you mentioned hot flashes, of course, is one of the more common symptoms. How does your book approach that topic? Yeah, so it, it, it's it's hard to describe, but the, each chapter is kind of a laid out like a like a restaurant menu. There's an introduction, there's an, an amuse bouche, there's an uh, there's an appetizer. The entree is the meat of the matter, the information about hot flashes in that case, and then there's a, a palate cleanser and a dessert. And so, for instance, like the the, the palate cleanser is a recipe, so you get sixteen recipes, and the recipe for that chapter happens to be I have the chapter miso soup with tofu, green onions, and seaweed. So yeah. So, you know, when you think about nutritional support, well, miso, soy-based, soybean, and you think about tofu, you know, there's a lot of discussion. You can look up articles and really get evidence based on this, but, you know, you think about phytoestrogens and kind of how they might be able to support a hot flash. Does it mean you eat tofu and, and, and miso all day? No, but that might help, you know, ratchet down a little bit. So that's kind of one example of, of how we kind of blend those things together. So how did you learn about that holistic approach? Because some doctors would say, you know, try this medication, you know, try estrogen, but you take a more holistic approach with these, with, you know, with this dietary example. How did you learn about that? Well, that came, that really just morphed from my program, Many for Change, where I had a lot of different practitioners. I had naturopathic doc, nutritionist, acupuncturist, exercise physiologist, psychologist. I mean, just the whole gamut. I paid their, all their salaries and they worked in my program. And, and really women came in and they would see me and we would do labs. We talk about the medical side of things, you know, Western medicine. And then they would really look on stress management techniques or body movement and, you know, nutritional support and all that really kind of, you know, in a nice little bow came together. And to me, that was just really the perfect way to take care of uh, anyone, but certainly women going through menopause. Now let's talk about some chronic diseases. And of course, the chronic disease that's most associated with menopause would be heart disease. Tell us about that connection. Yeah, so I don't profess to be an expert on, on heart disease. I would bow to some of my cardiology colleagues for that. But I would say, you know, there's amazing bodies of research going on right now, looking at, you know, estrogen, for instance, and, and the risk for heart disease. You can, you know, I think it's one of those double-edged coins. So, so Estrogen can help improve your lipid profile. Well, if you improve your lipid profile, that of course can maybe reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. Well, if you had four stents or heart bypass, is estrogen safe? Maybe not. So, you know, you have to look at kind of, you know, again, step back and look at those layers and see. And, and I'm, I'm very much schooled in the, you know, it, it, nothing's all or none. Like, you know, hormones are good or hormones bad. No, there's a lot of nuances there. And I think there's a lot of nuance when it comes to cardiovascular disease and a lot that we're learning too. Tell us about the cr common chronic diseases that may be associated with menopause. Yeah, I would say that it, it goes it goes both ways. So women who have chronic disease and they enter into that perimenopause or postmenopause may have added burden. You know, I'm, I can use myself, for example, I have rheumatoid arthritis. I've had it for 23 years. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, was my RA worse because of menopause? Yeah, probably. Was my menopause worse because of RA? Yeah, probably. So, you know, it kind of goes, goes both ways. I do think that, you know, God forbid we talk about weight. That's my favorite topic. But, you know, weight gain can certainly impact a lot of things in terms of the chronic illness arena. You know, first thing you think of is diabetes. And so, again, that could be kind of something that rears its head or becomes more of an issue when you think about perimenopause if weight gain is a problem. But then, you know, honestly, I think about what's happening in menopause. It's midlife. Well, what things are happening in midlife? Well, there are things that are happening maybe in your screening for cancer, certainly, 
It could be that you're developing osteoarthritis or other things that kind of lend themselves perhaps to a chronic illness. You're, you're worrying about osteoporosis or bone loss. So all of those, those kind of, you know, become important to focus and to think about when you think about that menopausal journey. One of the things that you touched upon in your Kevin MD article was a genetic predisposition when it comes to family history and how menopause affects one's health. Let's talk more about that. Yeah, I think the best example of that would be in terms of cancer screening. You know, we think about genetic testing. Many people have heard about BRCA and you know, the risk factor for other cancers, but certainly breast cancer. So that's one important thing. In fact, that might be part of the kind of package when you think about, hey, are, are hormones safe for you? For me, do you need to screen for that kind of cancer? So that that would be one marker to to pay attention to. Tell us some of the other major themes that you want readers to come away with in the book. Wow. I, you know, I like the fact that it's very experiential. So when you read this book, in fact, you don't have to read cover to cover. I kind of designed it like a coffee table book. You yeah. pick it up, maybe you turn to chapter eight and read for five minutes and then you're done. And so I like people to feel like they can hunt and search for something that's meaningful to them at that moment. Or maybe they have a friend like, oh, I have a friend with some urinary trouble, like, oh, chapter seven, that would be going to look up. You know, so it's just like a resource in that sense. But I also feel like if you know me, everything's a story. There's a lot of art, flowers and plants around me. And so I like that experience. So it's not like a medical text. It's not full of jargon. You have to look up every third word and Google, like, what does this mean? But at the same time, it's not, hmm, dare I say, snake oil and kind of the woo-woo stuff that is just really, unfortunately, very misleading. So it's it's a combination of things. And so I want people to feel like this is a, literally a book they can keep on their copy table and look at and feel validated. Like, oh my gosh, I'm not going pr- crazy. Brain fog is real. I'm not having a stroke or dementia. This is, this is I can do this. <laughs> What kind of advice do you have for women who say turns on the television or goes on the internet and there's a lot of drugs from the pharmaceutical industry that kind of medicalize a lot of the symptoms that menopausal women experience? What's what's your take on that? Oh boy, I have so many responses. First of all, that direct to consumer marketing, I think is just ridiculous. You know, how could how can anyone understand what this drug is and what it's for and what it's meant for? And they just have these stupid little, you know, cute little scenes. But I feel like not everything requires a medication and sometimes medications are really helpful. And so you have to, you have to really understand this is not just a decision for that woman to make. She should be working with her physician, working with her team, getting good guidance, getting understanding. Don't go to Dr. Google. (laughs) You know, you may love your cousin or your sister or your best friend, but you know, everyone is going to have a different experience. So I think it, it really validates getting really honest to goodness, good medical care. We're talking to Susan Baumgartel. She's an internal medicine physician. We're talking about her book, The Menopause Menu. And my final question, Susan, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Well, again, it's been a pleasure to be here. I think everyone needs an open mind when it comes to menopause. Uh, There are um, so many commonalities and so many similar stories. At the same time, every woman's journey is unique. And so I think as a woman, as a patient, make sure you ask questions of your physician, allow the time hopefully to be heard. As a physician, make sure you understand that you know you just can't throw the book at someone or just think hormones are the solution for all. It's good to have a dialogue and it's good to be open-minded. The book is called The Menopause Menu. Susan, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and insight. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you so much. 